Please pay attention to the following message. In case of emergency, please stand up calmly and leave the theater in an orderly manner. Use one of the emergency exits, which are located towards the lobby, on the left side of the stage, through the backstage doors, and on both sides of the mezzanine. Please follow staff instructions. Silence is vital for events inside the theater. To respect the people on stage, keep doors closed at all times, avoid talking during the event, and set your cell phones and mobile devices to silent. The seats in this theater have a fire retardant treatment. Therefore, food and beverages are strictly forbidden at all times. All seats in this theater were generously donated by members of our community, so please show respect by not putting your feet on the seat in front of you. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the event. This is the third call. Third call. Who am I? Where do I come from? What is the purpose of my life? Where will I go when I die? Time passes and most of our inner questions remain unanswered. Going forward, will artificial intelligence provide the possibility to transcend life's existential questions? I am part of human evolution. It is amazing to think that just 100 years ago we were transitioning from horses to cars. In today's world, we seem to be transitioning from our real selves to our virtual selves, oftentimes leading parallel, incompatible lives. How real are the social media profiles we post? Do our feeds and posts really reflect our lives? Can we trust an Airbnb host? Who will actually show up on a Tinder date? Will they end up stealing from us? Our dependency on our online lives has grown to such a point that we often forget where our virtual binary code us begins and our real analog us ends. But not everything about this tech-driven world is overwhelming or even negative. Yes, we probably depend too much on tech and have made our phones an extension of ourselves, if not the most important organ in our bodies. Yet there is a reason to be optimistic and truths to be gained that by studying and understanding these behaviors, we can identify bridges that close the gap between our self-perceived shortcomings and our self-imposed achievements. How can we use ever-increasing tech to our advantage? How will we face imminent challenges of becoming too artificial and too intelligent for our own good? Okay, I will destroy humans. How can it make us come closer together? Life is best not lived in extremes. We cannot presume to forego tech as we cannot presume that tech will be all encompassing. Multiple questions abound. Will robots perform all jobs and leave none to us creatures of skin and bones? Does a completely automated future await us? Will spirituality be effaced and substituted with lights? Can we find balance in a metaverse? ASF Talks is an opportunity to explore these difficult questions together as a community. Anxiety thrives in times of confusion. This is why it is so important to seek the bridges that help us make sense of who we really are, both as avatars and as human beings. Welcome to ASF Talks 2022, building coinciding bridges in a hyper-digital world. Hi, I'm Elena Perez, class of 85, and serving now as president of the Alumni Association. I will never forget the first time I came to the American school. It was back in 1972. I came with my parents for an interview with Mrs. Ansaldua, the elementary school principal. I was to be enrolled in the first grade for the following school year. She sat me on her lap and asked me to read out loud from my book. I did not know that moment would change my life forever. I could never have imagined that many years later, I would be standing here on this stage. 
On behalf of the Alumni Association and the ASF Talks Committee, I want to welcome all of you who are here in person and all of you who are joining us from afar through the wonders of technology. We are delighted to be back here after a long pause that kept us all away, but at the same time brought us together in spirit. We went through hard times and managed to overcome them. Last year, ASF Talks had to go completely virtual because of COVID. The silver lining was that we were able to reach our alumni who are literally all over the world. We cannot go back to having just in-person event. So now you can join from wherever you happen to be. Tonight, in this ninth edition of ASF Talks, we will listen to a series of amazing speakers and a discussion panel, all of them proud members of the ASF community. We will reflect together on the effects of the digital revolution in our human experience and enjoy a digital art exhibit that has been set up in the lobby. Throughout the evening, we will recognize three very dear members of our community who through their work, dedication and love have contributed to ASF becoming the great institution that it is today. We want to thank ASF for welcoming us, welcoming us alumni, for helping us reconnect with our community and for making us feel at home. Because for us, ASF is home. Now, without further ado, please help me welcome Mr. Mark Ivor Silty, ASF Executive Director. Thank you all very much, and thank you to each and every one of you, whether you're joining us in person or virtually, we're thrilled to have you. Tonight is about digital transformations and technologies. We have a very human reason to celebrate tonight as well. You see, back in February of 2020, I returned, Welcome from, to I returned from a teacher hiring fair in Boston having met many of my colleagues when I used to be in Asia and seeing how a relatively new pandemic at that time was affecting their schools. I came back here and we knew it was coming. We knew it was coming at some point to Mexico when we began to prepare as much as we could until March when we were the very first school, I think it was, to go on distance learning and remote office and try to cope with the situation uh, here in Mexico. And we did more than cope through the support of our parents and our students, our faculty, our administrators, our board of trustees, and our alumni. We had a remarkable year and a half to keep the learning going, keep the school together, to keep ASF a community. But then we had that another moment of trepidation in August of 2021 as we were again among the first to reopen our doors to in-person learning, open our offices again. We never knew what would happen from one day to another. Would we be closed next week? Would we be open? But we've kept it open through the year. People in Mexico have pulled together as a community. ASF has pulled together as a community. And we've done more than survive. We have thrived during this period. But we never lost sight of the fact that the human element, to be in class together, to be in offices and working together, to be on the sports field, to be in the music halls, to be in the theaters, as we'll begin performances very shortly here, it was all about being together. So we're so pleased that you're among our first to be able to come into campus again, to join us here in this magnificent facility, to celebrate the bonds of community. It's after 2.30. The rules of SEP no longer apply. If you would like to take your mask off tonight, if you feel comfortable, you are more than welcome to do so. If you have a reason to keep yours on, if you're traveling in a couple of days and you wanna make sure you test negative, if you have someone at home who may be immune compromised or a young infant and such, there's no judgment here. We each do what's best to take care of ourselves and their community. But what we want you to do, whether you keep your mask on or off tonight, enjoy the evening. Enjoy being together. Thank you to all who have worked so hard, to our alumni, institutional advancement, communications, other services like operations who helped with set up, to all of our sponsors and those who have given their time and their talents and their 
goods for tonight. Thank you all very much. Enjoy yourself. Thank you. Welcome to the ninth edition of ASF Talks. For the first time ever, we are both live in the FAC and online. Today, the Bear family is together around the world to join us in an incredible evening to keep learning about how digital media is transforming the world. Hi, I'm Lucia Serrano, class of 2015, and I will be your hostess tonight. Before we begin, let me tell you that we want you to participate as much as possible. So on the screen in a moment, you will see a QR code that I invite you to scan with your phones. It is for an app called Slido. You will be able to type in all your questions and the questions that are most repeated at the end of each talk will be answered. Now, our first speaker is an Apple Distinguished Innovator, Educator, Google Innovator, and ASF STEAM Coordinator who has worked for the past 25 years on finding innovative strategies for teaching and learning throughout Latin America, Sweden, and the United States. She is an expert in designing spaces and experiences that facilitate interdisciplinary, cross-divisional, hands-on learning, combining modern technology with manual tools in order to foment creativity and spark innovative ideas. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Tracy Bryan. Hi. Thank you all. Um, it feels really great to be up here on the stage. Um, you may know, you may not. I'm not an ASF alum, so I feel very honored that I was invited to speak to you all today, and I feel I'm among really good company. Um, I've spent 19 years of my educational career teaching here at ASF, so I've actually probably been lots of your teacher over the years, and so it's a real joy to be here tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about digital citizenship, and I'd like to start with this picture. This was texted to me two weeks ago from a concert my husband attended with my 10th grade daughter with the caption, Sacame de aquí, es un infierno. And so, get me out of here, it's hell. And so I laughed and I looked at it, thankful I wasn't at the concert. But what stood out to me was the fact that the kids who had so much been longing to go to a live concert for over a year were watching it behind the screen of their small phones. That triggered another memory from hearing this fact when I was fortunate enough to be up in the sound booth and, and watching, preparing an event for the ECC. And I was noticing that almost all the parents in the audience were watching their children from behind their small screens. So what I want to talk about a little bit tonight is how we say that art imitates life, life imitates art. Kids imitate their parents and what they see them doing. So I want to show you some, um, just some tips, some thoughts about digital citizenship. There's a lot of talk about doomsday and jobs disappearing and being replaced by robots. Actually, what we know is that technology is creating lots of new jobs. So the jobs will be different. We'll have very different types of jobs that are going to be high tech and high touch. And so it's equally important that we teach kids and we learn ourselves how to learn, relearn, prepare for new jobs, multiple careers, and have um, you know, the ability to pivot and change our careers multiple times. If you're interested, you can check out this website and take a test. It tells you what you'd be suited for in the future. Once I heard a speaker from Google say, I teach my kids how to cross the street because I can't ban traffic in LA. That reigns true for Mexico City as well. And it's a good parallel for the technology world. Our students, our children, were born into a world with technology. So it's to our advantage, to all of our advantage, to use the technology, to learn how to use it appropriately so that we can, we can learn and grow from it. The one thing I hear most often about little kids is they're digital natives. They were born with a device. They're used to it. You don't need to teach them how to use it. This is a really interesting one-page worksheet with six strategies for decoding words used by an elementary school teacher. If you imagine how hard it was for you to learn how to read a book, to decode words, to know how to read, to judge the validity of a book or the point of view of the author, just think about that multiplied by millions of authors on the internet. We can't just say they were born with it. Of course they're going to be able to touch a button and see a light flash, but that doesn't mean that they know how to use it or us either. There are institutions all over the world and government agencies that are working to develop digital citizenship standards that we can use and teach. And some of these broad categories are digital rights and responsibilities, literacy, communications, emotional intelligence, 
And within each of these categories, there are areas we can work on to use the technology to our advantage, to keep ourselves safe, and to share. If you're interested in knowing what kind of a digital citizen you are, you can take this quick test, and it'll give you strategies for improving your online time, for how you can be more of a creator instead of a consumer. So just little tips and ways that you can begin to be healthier online. The statistics are from the US. It's harder to find them from Mexico sometimes. But 72% of the American public uses some type of social media. That's including children. And the majority of social media sites are made for children at least 13 years or older. Every time we put a fake birthday in for a kid, we're exposing them to things that the software wasn't designed for. So things that we need to be mindful of. We know that the online world causes anxiety. We know that it can trigger suicidal thoughts in some kids. And there are software programs and things that can help you determine trigger words in conversations that might be um, leading to kids with unhealthy behavior. So those are things that are also being done with technology that are positive to combat some of the use of it online. As a teacher here at the school and teaching lots of digital literacy, I often hear, what are you doing about the girls? The girls. The girls are doing risky behavior. The girls have problems. The girls feel like they have to look a certain way. And let me tell you, the guys are feeling the same way. They're feeling the pressure, middle school boys, to look like a superhero, to you know, be super macho. And I've had just as many boys as girls ask me for tips and strategies to help them and talk to their parents about not feeling this pressure to be very macho or the one that can't have feelings. Social media sites, streaming services, Online games are fantastic at highlighting the zones of our brain and releasing dopamine and giving us the, the like or the streak or the next show right away. And that's fine and it can be relaxing, it can provide us entertainment, but we have to keep a balance there. We have to eat well, we have to rest, we have to do cognitively challenging activities instead of passively consuming this information. I like this ad a lot. It's Radio Shack 1993. So for some of you, that was the holy grail to go and get your devices, the computers, all this stuff. Out of curiosity, the stuff on there adds up to over $3,000. But you can make phone calls, you could make videos, you could do lots of things. The same things our kids can do today in the palm of their hands with a tablet or a telephone. So if it was really exciting to be able to get a video camera and make a video, and you're really proud to share that with your friends, why are we only consuming videos now? The idea is to use these technologies to be able to create content, to be a contributor. There are some statistics five or six years ago that said that 90% of the content on internet was only created by 10% of the users. So there are a lot more voices that need to be heard. Kids can tell their own story. They can make podcasts. They can create recordings. They can share it with the world. They can learn about electricity or things they might not be being taught by experts in their own school. I love this picture because a kid came in the other day to the makerspace and said, Miss Tracy, I'm the kid, the kid who had surgery and the kid who can't go to recess. Do you remember me? And I said, yes, I remember you, of course. He said, I got really bored, but then I realized I could learn anything I wanted while I wasn't at recess. I decided I wanted to make a flashlight because that'd be really cool, right? And I said, yeah, it's really cool. He said, here's my flashlight. And so he got on YouTube. He figured out how to make a flashlight. He you know, got the materials, put it together, and brought it in. So that's the power of the technology. It connects us with experts all over the world, allows us to learn things we wouldn't be able to learn in our own small town or city, or even somewhere as large as Mexico City, because it's infinite. This is a high school student who's learning photography, taking pictures, turning his photography into fantastic artwork, and using that to create multimedia presentations. These kids wanted to know how simple machines worked, so they decided to build their own arcade games using simple machines. So they got online, they figured out what a pulley was and how in inclined planes work and how I can make my own claw machine. And then they went back to the space and actually physically built it. So my, my point with this is, you know, not vilifying technology, but simply using it as an amazing tool to access the knowledge of the world and be creators. So the World Economic Forum has identified the top skills that in the next three to four years will be very important. Big categories like problem solving, self-management, working with people, and technology. And all of those things are really important for us to be teaching our kids and learning ourselves so that we can keep up in the new jobs to come. This quote really, really stood out to me. The amount of people who have access to their telephone 24 hours a day without moving their feet. 
So that's probably a lot of us in the room as well. When to know when to take the device away, when the kids are not creating, when we're not being healthy ourselves, when we're not modeling appropriately. Is the screen time affecting things in your household? Does it affect trips or what you wanna do? Does it affect your sleep, your eating habits? Once those things begin to affect, it's time to say device-free meals, no devices in bedrooms, things like that. The healthiest thing we can do is use our devices to create and share, connect, and then create a space between ourselves and our devices to revise, re regenerate, and, and be ready to learn more, to do more, and share more. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andres. Okay, how can our society work alongside social media platforms to prevent mental health issues? Okay, um, there are actually some nonprofit organizations worldwide that are working on this, and some of the same software engineers that created the algorithms that make social media so addictive are sort of letting the cat out of the bag, how to fix those, those algorithms and, and work with people. The other thing I think is really just education. Um, we need to know how it works, we need to know what's dangerous, and we need to know how to help ourselves take a break from it. Things like a simple digital citizenship quiz for your whole family, everybody does it separately and you come back and share, could be a powerful way to empower people within your family to make those choices. I also had a mom after one of these talks say, hey, my kids heard you and they decided to have a basket for the party and put their phones in the basket because they were afraid of what was being shown on social media, how it could affect them. So there are little tweaks that we can all do. What are the negative effects of limiting or prohibiting screen time on children's social life? Um, I think the, the truth of the matter is almost everything we do nowadays, whether buying tickets or, or you know, banking or schoolwork or whatever needs a device and needs a lot of times um, social media and screen time. So again, educating your children, it's no different than how do you eat healthy or how do you exercise or how do you take a break. It's more about understanding what can happen to you and how the physiological effects of too much technology on the brain and on your body. And I think that's it. Those are the two questions. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Tracy, for your very interesting thoughts on technology, how it's a great tool for learning, but it also comes with a bit of things that we need to take into consideration. In the ever-changing modern context, this knowledge is vital to keep sharing the upbringing of future generations. Something, however, that does not change among generations is that in ASF, we have the strongest sense of community. And the Alumni Association, along with all of its volunteers, do a great job of keeping our community together. They are the ones behind the organization of this amazing alumni party every year. So let's show them how much we appreciate them, all their hard work with a loud and warm round of applause. <laughs> Among ASF alumni, there are exceptional people who have not only achieved success in every possible way, but who have taken this success to give a lot back to the school. And today, we pay a tribute to one of them. Linda Farca, the oldest of seven children, was born in Mexico City to David and Raquel Farca. Her father, David, and his brother, Jacobo, who co-owned Mexico's first Preta Porte clothing factory, sent their children to ASF to the new Observatorio campus that opened in the late 1940s. All Farca cousins attended ASF, becoming the largest family to attend our school at a given time. Linda graduated in 1957 and always showed a knack for learning things quickly. She truly enjoyed her time as a student at ASF and was voted the wittiest by her classmates. She recalls the extracurricular activities, clubs, and sports that ASF offered in high school. She was a member of the Honor Society and several clubs and organizations, as well as treasurer in the school's theater production. She enjoyed studying Comercio, which was offered at the time in ASF, so that students could have the opportunity to forge careers in business. She credits her teacher, Mrs. Julie Stevenson, for teaching her business fundamentals and inspiring her to pursue a future in business. 
Linda says ASF taught her to open her horizons and think outside the box, to believe in herself, and to take risks. After graduating from ASF, she married Miguel Lich. They started a craft business venture in 1965, which they named Fantasias Miguel. The first store was on Uruguay Street in downtown Mexico City, which they now refer to as La Tienda Chica. Presently, there are over 30 branches of Fantasias Miguel in eight states throughout Mexico. The Lichis had four children, all of whom attended ASF. Daniel graduated in 1979, David in 81, Alberto in 85, and Cynthia in 1990. While juggling her new roles as wife, mother, and entrepreneur, Linda also decided to go back to ASF as a volunteer. She went from homeroom mother to board member to president of the PTA. In this last position, she launched the first art fair, one of ASF's finest traditions. The construction of the PTA Plaza that continues to be a great gathering place was also one of her projects. She then went on to serve as president of the Alumni Association from 1987 to 1988 to help make the American School's Centennial Anniversary an extraordinary celebration. It was an event that many will never forget. Linda and her team put together the first alumni directory with names from the 1920s to the 1990s. She also started the publication of the Alumni Gazette as a magazine. She has seen eight of her grandchildren attend ASF and her first of seven great-grandchildren is currently enrolled in kindergarten. She will be class of 2034. Those of us who have had the honor and pleasure of working with Linda as volunteers or alumni, known her as a classmate or as a friend, are proud and grateful for the extraordinary love and effort she has put into our school and our community throughout the years. Bueno, 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 sí. <laughs> bueno. ASF board members, Mr. Mark I. Tilti, Executive Director, Mrs. Ana Elena Perez, Alumni Association President, Cultural and Values Committee, Teachers, students, and fellow alumni. I am very grateful for the honor bestowed upon me with this recognition of my life in the ASF. I should be thanking <laughs> the school for giving me the opportunity and liberty to do so many things that have formed me as a person as well as my love for continuous learning and self-confidence. I am definitely thanking all the wonderful people, school board members, superintendents, teachers, school staff, fellow school parents, alumni, classmates, and family, who throughout the years always supported me. My very special thanks to all the hundreds of volunteers who collaborated with me to make possible the projects that I was able to, to accomplish for the school. They were my passion through my time as a volunteer. None of them would have been possible without their unconditional support, confidence, and faith in me. 
I am very happy to see the continuation of these projects over, over 50 years. I am very proud to be an American School alumni and will continue being a promoter of the excellent education given at the ASF. As an 81-year-old, I feel entitled to give a little unsolicited advice to the younger generations. Dream big. Have faith in yourselves. Help others. Promote teamwork. Volunteer and be happy. Thank you very much. Giving back to our community is vital to help us grow, and it uncovers the need we have for capital, assets that help us feel secure, transcend, and evolve. Our next speaker knows everything there is to know about one thing that, let's admit it, worries us all, money. And money in this modern era has taken so many shapes, cash, credit cards, cryptocurrencies, $1,000 loans to our Tinder boyfriends because they're being persecuted by their enemies. Are these the final forms of financial systems, or are we only seeing the beginning of a transformation of waiting to happen? Please help me welcome Julio Marquez, class of 1980. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, so kind, so kind. This is a $100 bill. In the future, nobody's going to know what to do with it. I doubt that if someone drops it on the floor, people would pick it up. In fact, I have two more here. And I, same thing, I think, that this is, this is a likely scenario. But before I tell you a little bit more about what I think about the future of money, I do want to thank, first of all, Andrea Montiel of the... Um, ASF alumni office for convincing me to come here from New York. I live in New York and I came here. Thanks, Andrea. And I also want to thank my mother because she's in the audience in a wheelchair, but she's here after driving me and my sister 15 years to this campus, you know, a long, long time ago. Um, and then finally, my father, uh, his birthday is today. He would have turned 94 where he's still alive today, uh, but he did attend the American school uh, even and before the, this great campus and, and, you know, and before what, what, um, what we were just looking at, which were those old pictures of the original construction. The American school was in Insurgentes even before that. But uh, let's get back to, to, to money. Um, uh, I told you I live in New York, and that's, uh, that's the New York City subway. And I saw this, this ad in the subway the other day. It simply says, to explain, to condescendingly explain finance, investing, or crypto to a person who is already knowledgeable about the topic, probably because they invested with Titan. I, I don't know what Titan is, but I thought, I thought it was a funny ad because I don't want to explain. And so, um, you know, I'm sorry if I get a little basic to those of you who already know a little bit about the subject. Um, but, uh, you know, humanity has always loved, loved money, they've talked about money, and we know that because it's in Polanco's streets. In other words, all of these people here said things about money, and they all have streets in Polanco, which is why we know they're important. Um, I'm not going to read them all to you, but um, there will be instructions on how to get a copy of my presentation at the very last page. Um, except, of course, the last one here, that's Martin. I love money, I love everything about it. I, I bought some pretty good stuff, got me a $300 pair of socks, got a first sink, an electric dock polisher, a gasoline-powered turtleneck sweater, and of course, I bought some dumb stuff, too. There is still no street uh, named after uh, Steve Martin Polanco, but it, it has to happen. Uh, there is a conclusion here. It's time to rename Calle Tennyson, who appears to not have said anything about money, to Calle Steve Martin, 
which will at least better reflect Restaurante Pujol's uh, values. I'm going to look into that after my current dinner reservation, which is on 2026. But there's the map of Polanco. Um, speaking of very old people, the Flintstones foretold it all. They had a pre-paper clunky currency, and they always complained and fought about money. But there was one episode in which they traveled to the mid-21st century, and they met the Jetsons. And I've always liked that episode. It's available online. They go to the new bedrock, and they go to a restaurant. And um, Barney uh, asks, asks Fred if he, if he has any money. He said, no, I don't have clamshells, which is what they used. But it turns out that you don't need money in the future. The guy said, just scribble whatever you want here, and you can come in and eat whatever you want. So they went in, and, uh, well, they didn't solve every problem because Fred didn't get as much, money, as much, uh, as much food as he wanted. Um, anyway, we think we've seen financial innovation. Uh, we bank from laptops. We buy coffee uh, with a wave of phone. But these are minor miracles compared with the dizzying experiments now underway around the globe. Innovation is happening in all of those uh, banking, insurance, investments, payments. There's innovation galore. Um, so what are some of the changes that we're going to see? First, the end of physical cash. And that's what I'm talking about with these $100 bills. Um, you know, th they're going to go away. Um, and they're going to go away because we're going to see, see the end of having a single currency economy. Right? Of course, there are many countries, and many of them have their currency. But the end of the single currency for any one of us is here. Um, and you know why? Because people hate inflation. Yes, it's convenient to buy things um, digitally, but inflation is a major problem, and that's a driving force. The government cannot really be trusted with always creating more money in excess of the growth and creating inflation. And so finally, you know, this is the buying power of one dollar over time. Um, it, just since 1980, the year when I graduated, uh, look, at the, look at how the dollar has lost power because of inflation. And this is really the reason why everybody on Wall Street and everybody in the financial sector would like to get rid of having the currency um, economy. Um, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but this gives you an idea of the philosophy. This is my favorite anarchist, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. And this is in Spanish. And he said, look, all of those things being governed means being controlled, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm going to read it now. If you don't believe it in Spanish, I have it in French for you. Um, I can, uh, and, and I even put a picture where he's a little bit more impressionistic for the French. And now this is a this is a Russian quote um, by Ayn Rand. And what's interesting about putting the Russian quote is because right now Russian citizens are exhibiting why having rubles is not necessarily the best thing for them. They they, all of a sudden, there's a devaluation. They, you know, the, the ruble is going to be in, in, in serious trouble. And yet, there are many Russians who hold Bitcoin and other currencies. And that's one powerful reason to have crypto. So that's really what's happening. No one thinks the dollar or the euro will disappear soon. However, um, there are going to be a whole choice of different currencies that you can make payments with. And you'll be able to really choose whatever you want. Facebook, Google, Amazon, they're all working on things like that. Um, and the other, the other big trend that's happening is people, people, governments around the world want financial inclusion, that where everybody has access to the system, not just the people with enough cash, but everybody. So you're looking at what's happening now in places like El Salvador with Bitcoin available as a, as a currency. And then there's all these new... Um, currencies that are available and um, I got these six um, which I think are the best people ask me well what are the six currencies if, if I wanted to invest in crypto that I should buy and so I came up with a very helpful um, little thing to say right buy lemons except since Columbus returned Bitcoin like Litecoin Ethereum Solana Cardano Ripple and so if you remember this very uh, you know um, easy uh, little saying, you can pick one of these six. I think that these six are the ones that are going to really be big, they're going to um, mature, and they're going to be available in the future to choose. Especially the Solana and Cardano, which uh, operate with something called uh, proof of um, 
proof of stake in, instead of proof of work. Um, easy to look up those terms, but they're a lot greener. They, they waste a lot less energy. Um, these are six stocks that are pretty good to own because all of these companies are involved in serious financial um, innovation. And uh, you also have some private companies, these four, which when they go public, I think you ought to be, pay attention to them. They're all doing really interesting things um, in, the, in, in finance. Um, so, need money? In the past, tough luck, you'd have to get a raise, get an expensive credit card. But now you can do more things. You can go fund me, you can make popular TikToks, and in the, in, in pretty soon, you're all going to be able to switch currencies, and you're even going to be able to sell NFTs. Um, I listed here uh, what you would need to do to create your own currency, and then I listed here what you would need to do to create your own NFT. But these days, you can simply sell your own currency, sell your own NFT, and make money that way, as long as you can convince other people to buy that. Um, so finally, um, you know, not, NFT is, not every NFT is worth buying, but certainly it's worth looking into maybe creating one. Um, this NFT just sold for $69 million. Um, and uh, this, uh, if the, the people at home can scan this code, you can get to a famous Frida uh, NFT that um, has made a lot of money for its creator. So you need money in the not too distant future, you're gonna do all this. We're almost there. And just to check whether the idea of cash that is interesting to pick up, if we're there yet, I brought a little bit more cash for all of you. So let's see who picks it up. Let's see if we're actually, um, but there's going to be a lot of cash on the floor here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna skip some things here, but whoever wants a copy of my presentation can write me an email right there and I'll be happy to forward what I said. Thank you again. I went a little. Thank you, Julio, for a very interesting take on how financial systems are evolving and how they will keep evolving with digital innovation. When you graduate from ASF, you take with you all the good memories of the experiences and of the people you cross paths with, who will always have a special place in your heart. Among those people are the teachers that made a difference. Tonight, we want to honor one of those teachers who has made a huge impact in ASF students throughout many, many years. Funky coma data. The early 90s radio hit called Funky Cold Medina brings back great memories of our beloved high school math teacher, Mr. Good, and his priceless performance lip syncing this popular tune at an ASF talent show. Oh, uh, Mr. Good, you were a demanding teacher who made most of us learn to love math, but also ended up loving you. I can say without a doubt, Mr. Good, you were the best math teacher I ever had. It was thanks to you that I found it easy to understand math and you gave me confidence. About 10 years after graduating, I decided I needed to go to business school. In order to get in, you have to take a GMAT. And the GMAT, a large part of that is the quantitative math section, which is like math on steroids. I took the test and I scored under 40%. And you'll never get into business school with that kind of score. I called up Mr. Gloom, he kind of remembered me. I explained to him the situation and he said, come see me. And then for the next three months, every Wednesday for 90 minutes, he walked me through the exercises needed to get a good score on that math section of the GMAT. Three months later, I scored an 87, I applied to business school and I got into Harvard. I am so thankful for your steadfast effort and unwavering determination to get us to understand all those formulas and equations. I would not be the scientist or physician I am today without the lessons I learned in your classroom not just in math, but also lessons in discipline, kindness, patience, and perseverance. Ms. Gudu was my calculus teacher, the best math teacher I ever had. He used to make 15 problem tests to be solved in 45 minutes. When I got to college, you had to solve 10 problems in one hour and 30 minutes. 
a lot of time to spare. I clearly remember the quizzes and tests, but the best were the quests. He said, they smell like a quiz, but count like a test. We will always remember the excellent time we had in your math class. I loved your passion and your ability to uh, teach math at the level at which that you did. It has uh, greatly affected and amplified the way that my passion and desire to understand math and hopefully teach it at the same time. Thanks to Mr. Good, I realized that not only did I not hate math, I was actually pretty good at it. I swear under my personal truth and honor that I have neither given nor received any information on this day. I got hit by a car and spent many months in bed. Mr. Wood could, would come to my home and help me keep my competency in math. Thanks to him, not only I stayed in grade, but I also sustained my love for math. I am sure that Mr. Good was one of the biggest influences in me becoming an educator. I salute Mr. Good because I'm sure that he touched many of his students' lives and he made a di positive difference in the world. Congratulations, Mr. Good. Wherever you are, to this day, I'm still grateful. Thank you for the patience, Mr. Good. Thank you so much, Mr. Good. I'll always remember you as one of my favorite teachers. Thank you very much for everything you taught us, Mr. Good. We love you. Great memory. Thank you very much for everything. Mr. Good, I just want to say thank you for uh, all your years of service to the ASF community. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. You have been admired, respected, and appreciated by all your students for more than 30 years. When he asked how he feels about the impact on our school, he says, I've always been very proud of the many students who accomplished so much after I tortured them to love learning and achieving success. I refused to compromise the standards and I have zero regrets. Thank you for everything, Mr. Gould. What can I say? Just hang on, yeah. Um, this is a special night, not the least reason of which, because it's the first time in 19 years that I've worn a necktie. <laughs> and um, also, I'm not wearing a jacket because the ones I have don't fit anymore. But 49 years ago, I talked to Mo Blum. It turned out it was August of 1973, and a teacher had quit right before school started, and Mr. Blum was desperate. So I talked to him for five minutes, and he told me to call him back on Monday morning. It was a Friday. And so that weekend, I um, was trying to find out something about the American school, and I couldn't find anything in the New York Public Library. So I called the Mexican Travel Bureau in Rockefeller Center. And I talked to this lady, I said, do you know anything about the American school in Mexico City? And she said, yes, I graduated from there. So it's a small world. But I was lucky to have come here to take the chance. I thought it would be nice to spend a couple of, we couple of years in uh, another country, and uh, here I am 49 years later. And let me tell you why. Because of my kids. I'm shaking because it is the gospel truth. 
Cindy George, who is sitting behind me, flew here from Chicago to be here tonight. And we were sharing an apartment together for several years. She can tell you that, she, that I was nuts because every morning going to school, I was excited to be coming. And I was excited because of the people I was working with, my students. And this is, what, what can I say? This is a great honor for me. It came out of the blue, to tell you the truth. And I'm honored that you think I deserve this. Thank you. Mr. Good, few professionals get to cross the path between fulfilling their job and being a true devotee to the art of teaching. This school has been honored with your legacy. Your devotion, your passion, your love for teaching has left a positive mark on hundreds. Mr. Good, you are and always will be greatly loved. Thank you. Once again, we love to see you participating, so don't forget to send your questions up in the Slido app. I leave you now with Jennifer Nassif, class of 1986, who will moderate today's panel on technology and high-quality human relations, a call to action. Please give a round of applause to our panelists. Alejandro Adler, class of 2005. <laughs> Margarita Tarragona. And Sofia Gomez, class of 29. Good night, everybody. Okay, so today we have Dr. Margarita Tarragona, who is a psychologist and the mother of three ASF grads. Jordi Isabel and Pao Oliveres. She is professor of the practice and director of the ITAM Center of Wellbeing Studies at the Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México and a lecturer for the University of Pennsylvania Certificate in Applied Positive Psychology. Margarita is the president of the Mexican Positive Psychology Society. Margarita. Gracias, thank you. <laughs> We also have Sofia Gomez Barreiro, class of 09, has a specialty in Gestalt Human Development, EFT Tapping Certification, and Theta Healing Certification, among other postgraduates. Courses and trainings in the mental health spectrum. Sofia is passionate about personal growth and mental health, believes in our infinite potential as human beings, and has the mission to create more depth, fullness, and empowerment. Sofia. And last but not least, Alejandro Adler, class of 05, directs Columbia University Center for Sustainable Development, Wellbeing Science and Policy Initiatives. He is also the Director of Wellbeing Science and Policy at the United Nations Sustainable Development Network. Dr. Adler works with a number of multilateral organizations with the governments of various countries, including Bhutan, Nepal, India, Mexico, Peru, the United States, Australia, Jordan, and Colombia, to infuse education systems in these countries with positive psychology skills and life competencies, to measure the impact of these interventions on youth's well-being, and to ultimately inform and transform education systems and policy. Ale. My name is Jennifer Nassif, class of 86. I have two girls who came to the to ASF, one graduated two years ago, one is a senior, and I invite you to watch my TED Talk, How to Motivate Your Children, 
with more than a million views, and very soon, Estefania's TED Talk on how to motivate your parents. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. So, we are living in a time where digital era is dominating our lives in different ways, some positive, some negative. It has the knowledge and power to hack our minds by knowing our likes and dislikes, even things we're not even aware of. It can influence many of our decisions, impact elections, control information, and even hide inconvenient truths if governments wish to. In terms of our relationships, life has become more complicated. We have more options, but less patience, more apps and less commitment, more information, yet less intelligence. Marriages that last less and romance, well, another ball game. <laughs> Fidelity is going through a state of crisis. And until death do us part, seems like an idea of the past. And our children are at a crisis of their own. They are more depressed and feel more social pressure than ever before. So today we will discuss how Digital area on social media is changing our behavior, and more importantly, what we can do about it so that we can learn how to control it so it doesn't control us. Thank you. <laughs> so, Alejandro, would you like to start us with a few words, please? Sure. Uh, thank you. It's a privilege, an honor, uh, a real pleasure to be with all of you tonight. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, Jenny and the rest of our panelists, I think it's unquestionable that the last two years since March 2020, our relationships have changed, and I believe they've changed permanently. Our relationships with technology, our relationships with ourselves, our relationships with our romantic partners, with our families, with society. And on March 20th, uh, less than a month ago, we at the UN released the World Happiness Report. It's a report we launch every year where we rank countries uh, from one to 147 on how they're doing in terms of global life satisfaction. And we've seen trends throughout the pandemic. And we've seen that overall countries have been much more resilient than we think, but there are trends. There are trends where countries that have strong psychosocial fibers, where human relationships are strong, where policies didn't force people to isolate, those countries fared a lot better psychologically than countries where people isolated. And we've seen that generosity increased between 10 and 20% globally during the pandemic. And it's in countries where it increased 30 or 40% that life satisfaction actually increased during the pandemic. These are Scandinavian countries, New Zealand, Australia, and the like. Now, something else we've seen, especially we know the pandemic brought a health crisis, a physical health crisis, an economic crisis, but it also brought a mental health crisis, particularly among adolescents and young adults, uh, an epidemic of depression, of anxiety, and of substance abuse. But we've been working with governments in education in over 20 countries, embedding well-being and resilience skills, mainly in adolescents. And we've seen that these skills that are learnable and teachable have inoculated adolescents and young adults against these trends of depression, anxiety, and abuse of, uh, of substances. And we've been able to leverage technology to not only digitize our programs, but to scale them up in ways that we've never been able to before when we used to do everything person to person, in person. So that's one silver lining of, um, of the pandemic. We've also seen that in countries where people have been forced to isolate because of government policies and they've been overusing social media, that has been highly detrimental to mental health, again, particularly among adolescents and young adults. So bottom line of my opening statement is technology is a double-edged sword. It's a force for good or a force for bad, but we know it can, it can and should be a force for good. And the second bottom line is that strong human connections are the number one predictor of global life satisfaction, and they prevent ill-being, psychological ill-being. Okay, super. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Margarita, your words on especially relationships, 
Right. Uh, thank you, Alejandro. You know how much I admire the way you, the work you do and the large scale of the studies that you're a part of and the interventions that you're a part of. I will speak from the perspective of a psychotherapist working one-on-one -on -one or with couples and families. And like you said, and also other speakers have mentioned, clearly technology is both a blessing and a curse. And how many things in life really have a paradoxical nature or at least have a tension within them? So I was thinking that, especially during the pandemic, at different points of the life cycle, we see the pros and cons of technology. For example, couples who are dating. I've heard of many couples who, because they couldn't see each other, feel they develop very deep relationships, being able to have long conversations, ongoing chats or conversations. On the other hand, lots of people have this fear of missing out when you're dating online and you find somebody you like, but what if the next one would be even better and I'm stuck with the one I chose? And in terms of established um, couples, for example, how uh, technology can be used as a way to create intimate little rituals to you know, text each other throughout the day or have your, your inside jokes and also as a means of control and jealousy over your partner. In terms of whole families, how during the pandemic, I've seen a lot of fathers in particular be so joyful to be able to spend more time with their kids and to witness them being uh, learning online and be amazed at the kinds of things their kids know how to do. But at the same time, we've seen the blurring of boundaries between work and family life and the never ending uh, work that people do even from their bed. Um, in terms of practices that have to do with, with well-being or, or mental health, there's the wonder of being able to work with people who may have never come to us, to our offices. And also, I think it's kind of funny, I had a lot of closet therapy sessions in which people would go to their closet because that was the only place where they could connect and have some privacy. So um, I, I think that there's so many ways that we can use technology to strengthen relationships and at the same time to be aware of the risks that are inherent in the use of technologies. Super, Margarita. Thank you so much. I'll, I have my questions for later. Mm -hmm. And finally, last but not least, so you're going to focus on a perspective on well-being and all your studies. So what do you have to say about this? Thank you. Does this work? Sí, perfecto. Thank you. Um, I believe we have the power to choose which side of technology we want to filter. We can become filters in our lives and make choices that help our mental health. Technology, as we know, has two sides. So this digital revolution can help us in our human development. We can help our mind, we can help our mental health by filtering the content we choose, by filtering and knowing or detecting, is this content making me or triggering my anxiety or triggering an uncomfortable feeling or is this content making me feel more inner peace or helping my mind, helping my heart, helping my mind know or learn new things? There are two main things that are the causes of unhappiness and they are the environment we are surrounded by and our, um, our high standards so, and our, and our self-demanding. -demand, so, we can check in ourselves and realize who am I surrounding myself with? What am I reading? What am I listening to? What am I watching? Is the technology I'm using helping me? Are the, are the, is the content I am reading or listening to triggering something I don't like and being more conscious about what we're reading? I think uh, we, as human beings, have an infinite potential. We can grow and develop through depth, through self-responsibility, and through more conscious. And we can do this by having more self-acceptance, by having more self-confidence and self-love. And we can learn these things with technology. Technology has amazing tools, amazing experts, that are massively sharing what they know to people who 
like you said before, maybe didn't have the time or didn't have, were not in the same city as the, as the person. So technology is helping us to reach millions of people and, ha and it's in ourselves, it's in our minds and in our choices, in our, the filter we have inside to make the correct choices and to make the correct, um, maybe not the correct, but to be more conscious about what I'm looking because it's easy to scroll fast. It's easy to get engaged in amazing uh, social media accounts that are maybe false lifestyles or uh, false images or filters that unconsciously or subconsciously make our mind send the trigger of anxiety and maybe we don't even realize it's happening. And when you look back, you remember or you, you don't know why you're feeling that way. And if we can be more conscious and choose what we are reading, listening to, then we can have technology on our side and help our social, our mental health. Thank you, Sofia. I have a question first for Alejandro. You were mentioning that the, the target group that suffered most oppression during the, this time, the pandemic, were the adolescents. Specifically, what can we do as parents, most, many of us right now have adolescent kids, to lessen that impact? Right, so the reason it's most affected adolescents is adolescence is a grossly misunderstood developmental period as merely a period to be survived. Uh, as a very tumultuous period, but really it's an age of opportunity. It's when people define their identity, their values, their attitudes. They start to question who they are, their meaning and purpose in life. And so when you're isolated from your natural ecosystem, your social ecosystem, you lose perspective and you don't have the psychosocial tools to define all those key elements of an integrated identity. And so the best thing parents and educators can do is first to learn and to live the well-being skills before they can teach and embed them into adolescents that they interact with. So these skills range from mindfulness meditation, self-awareness, emotional literacy, effective communication, critical thinking, creative thinking, decision making, ethical reasoning, and the list goes on. But We've seen that well-being skills are learnable and teachable, but before you can teach these skills as an educator or as a parent, you need to be able to embody and to emulate them so that by osmosis, you can transmit them to your adolescent children, Preach adolescent students, and then you can explicitly teach them, but without hypocrisy, right? Correct. So there's a learn the skills, live the skills before you can teach and embed them. Wow, great advice. Thank you, Alejandro. Margarita, you were saying that there was a group of couples that thrived during mm -hmm. the pandemic. For the rest of us, could you share with us a few of the keys that you observed in these couples that thrived? I think like it's different for every couple, but some things that may have in common, I think one of them is to have an ongoing curiosity and communication. I know it sounds like such a cliche, but it's yeah. true. Uh, I think oftentimes we believe we already know what the other person is gonna say, we know what they think. So for those who approached the pandemic or in general with an, a sense of, I, I'll never know you completely, how is this for you? What does this mean for you? Um, that, that's very helpful. There's even games that are out lately that have become very popular, games to foster or spark conversation that have unusual questions, like who was your favorite math teacher? Or um, uh, things that help people renew their curiosity for an one another. And then I also think that an, an important aspect can be to nurture the sense of us, or we, but also to have your own life and some space between you. So there's um, many couples therapists say that it's important not to be either too close or too far away, to have that right balance between and some air to breathe between you. Right, Gibral Halin in one of his poems, he said no, that a good couple is like two posts exactly. united by a, by a roof. Uh -huh. So they are, they have their space, 
but they have this union. No? Exactly. Thank you so much, Margaret. Uh, amazing. I never thought of that curiosity of asking different questions, even if you've been married for so long. <laughs> Great observation. Ale, you mentioned, este Ale, Sofia, you mentioned something that was super interesting also. Because, yes, we are triggered by, by different things that cause more anxiety. The problem here is in social media, they know what causes anxiety, but they like it. Why? Because that engages you. Exactly. And the more time you spend on Facebook or on Google or all their sites, the more money they earn. So they keep triggering you with things that make you addicted exactly. in a negative way to keep looking at social media. We're supposed to be more conscious, but how can we beat these algorithms that know us better than we know ourselves to be more conscious and make better decisions? Yes, I think you're totally right. And what might help is having clear what are my priorities or what do I want to learn or what do I want to get out of this time in social media? So first, how much time do I want to spend here and what content do I want to consume? So before I engage in the addiction, because it's really easy to engage and scroll and don't even notice you are in it. Make prior conscious to, to say, okay, who am I following? What am I reading? What am I listening? Or what do I remember are the accounts or the blogs or the, the brands that I am reading and make a filter beforehand. No? So get in your social media and make a cleaning. And then while you're in it, Try to make maybe five minutes or 10 minutes or two minutes, depends on how much time you're going to be in it, um, stops or pauses and ask yourself, how is this making me feel? What am I learning from this? Is this helping my inner peace? Is this helping my mind? Am I being better or worse? And then it's, it's different for every one of us, like Margarita said. So each one of us is going to have a different formula. But I think it gets back to being more conscious and discovering other accounts. Because as you say, social media knows exactly what triggers us. So it's really easy to get into the addiction. So maybe get out of that comfort zone and start searching for new concepts or new themes that are going to get into the algorithm. And then th the same uh, tech is going to feed us back. Thank you, Sofia. Thank you so much. Well, we have a few minutes for the public. For I'm sure you have a lot of questions. So please send us your questions. So to our panel, if you have a specific question for someone in particular, that would be great to ask. Híjole. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Dice, a social media, are social media companies interfering each day more with freedom, correct, of speech? Or are some of their censorship actions justified? Who wants to answer this one? I, I definitely, I'm going to meter mi cuchara here. Este, definitely there is censorship. We have noticed it, especially during the pandemic. We were talking about that. Um, what governments, if a government is pro or anti-vax, we can find more or less of the information. So they're definitely involved in what we can see and what we can't see. The actions are justifiable. It depends who you ask. If you ask the governments, they'll tell you absolutely. If you ask the independent people, they'll say absolutely not. I don't know if anyone else has something else to say about that question. No? If not, we can go. We have a lot of questions, eh? To Alejandro, which skills are we, are we helping young people? See? Which skills can we help for young people, I guess? Maybe you can repeat the summary you gave us of the skills that we can help for the young people to be less depressed and stuff. Sure. I mean, so the traditional academic model focuses on filling the bucket with math, science, reading, history. But we know that if you don't use knowledge, within two years, you'll forget about 90% of what you've learned. What we focus on is fostering habits, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral habits. And if I had to choose core skills that we, we have a list of 37 skills that we know have three Ms. They're measurable, they're malleable, and they're meaningful and that they contribute to favorable, favorable life skills. Can we find them somewhere, those, the 37? Yes, if you, if you go Google into them? Google, my LinkedIn, email me, and I'm happy to share them. But I would say mindfulness lays the ground work 
to build on every other social emotional co cognitive skill self awareness emotional literacy effective communication judgment and decision making critical thinking creative thinking teamwork i would say those are the most important ones but the least the list is quite comprehensive and exhaustive and whenever we work in a new country we adapt the skills so that they're most relevant to the local context and community. Your email is? I want those <laughs> lists of questions. <laughs> aadler12 at gmail.com. Super. Another great question. What technologies it impact positively has caught your attention in social media? See, si, Margarita. Well, I was not thinking so much of social media as of apps. Or apps, Th there of There are course. certain apps, for example, Happyfy, that has a very strong research team behind it. And it's uh, an app that you can take like short courses or that can send What's you... What's the name of it? Happyfy. Happyfy. Um, or you can be, you can also, you know, it reminds you to do certain things. It has information. It, and it's been shown to have an effect, a positive effect on depression. It increases well-being in the workplace. So, and like that, I don't know if you have others in, in mind, Alex, but it really has been um, empirically shown to boost people's well-being. Wow. There's wow. also an amazing app called Insight Timer. Insight yes. Timer. Yes, which has literally millions of meditations uh, with any theme you want. So you can type in what's going on with you and you can look and you can find a lot of meditations like one minute meditations, 30 minute meditations, five minute meditations, wow. guided meditations on the, the on the theme you want. So it's really great. Wow. Another question. How do we learn to identify the sources when we don't even realize that they are triggering us? Um, I think it's when you look back and make an introspection. So it's a lot of self-work, it's uh, diving inside and, pro and writing, what, that's what works for me. Writing what's uncomfortable, what's bothering me and then trying to look for the things that might be triggering that feeling. So every feeling has a thought and every thought has a mental connection. So when we, when we have the uncomfortable act, action, we can go back. So then we have the, uh, I'm feeling un uncomfortable. Then what am I thinking that's making me feel uncomfortable? What are the thoughts I have? And then what is the source of, the, of these thoughts? Well, great advice from our panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you ASF Talks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no more time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for this amazing debate on the relation between technology and human relations. Thank you. Thank you. Tonight in this incredible evening, we stand together in the Fine Arts Center, which turns 10 years old. The people who have been here for those 10 years, such as Teru and Hugo and so many others, are behind the incredible events that take place on this stage. I had the honor of being in the first play ever to be presented on this stage, Beauty and the Beast. And I can tell you that putting together the magic of show is no easy task. We want to thank the Institutional Advancement, Communications, Fine Arts Center, Operations, and Security staff who have always been here helping us each step of the way and have made the ninth edition of ASF Talks a reality. Please help me with a warm round of applause. Now, our next speaker is a graduate from political science at Colgate University. She's been a social worker in New York City where she created workshops on topics including sexual health and drug awareness. She is an expert in education focusing on multicultural education and professional development and personal, social, health, and economic education. And she is passionate about empowering parents and educators with the knowledge and tools to nurture self-worth in young people. Her motivation is, is based on work experience, research, and most importantly, raising her three daughters. Please help me welcome Jessica Hawley, class of 97.
Hello, hello, ASF. It's a huge pleasure to be here tonight. My name is Jess, and I am a sexual health educator. It's a great job. I get to go into schools and talk to mostly very hormonal audiences of teenagers. And um, it really is a huge responsibility, but a massive privilege, because so many students have very little access to sexual health. If they're missing for the one day where you had a drop down day to talk about sexual well being, they might have missed their entire year worth of reproductive rights or understanding what consent is, or understanding, even moving forward, how to be sexual citizens online. So I've been working with an organization called The Rap Project for the last four years, and it stands for Raising Awareness and Prevention. And it really stands for trying to help young people navigate growing up seamlessly on and offline. And what I love about tonight is I really want to build, actually, on what our fellow presenters have been talking about today. So the first thing I want to talk about is guidance, because I've listened to some of the questions you've put forward in terms of what can we actually do? Is there censorship allowed? How do we deal with this? Well, there's good news. So the Children's Code of 2021 was a very important piece of legislation. It was pushed forward by an organization called the Five Rights Foundation, which is entirely created to protect the digital rights of children. And I have to say, Mexico is a co-signatory, which is amazing news, under the Instituto Nacional de Acceso a Información. So there is a body of people, of course, who help you understand what access to information is. And it is part of this working group of understanding how to anticipate the needs of children moving forward as digital citizens. So what this code has done is really important because it's setting the stage for future app developers, for websites, in terms of creating 15 different guidelines. And some of these include things like, for instance, you can no longer create apps that are designed for children that include nudges that will automatically ask you for your location. We know that kids love to have their status update on WhatsApp. However, they can no longer do this. In fact, the real benchmark of this legislation is that the way design has to now take place within any kind of digital space has to take children's well-being as a foundation. So it's really interesting that this is finally coming forward because as we know, really technology was not created with children in mind. It's been retroactive, it's been retrospective, it hasn't really been anticipatory. And that's the real change that we're now finally seeing. So I think it's really wonderful that we have an opportunity now to really protect and to create spaces that no longer can hide behind loopholes of the 13 plus digital loophole, right? Well, this is, this is you know, with things like TikTok or Instagram or Facebook Meta, where they can hide behind the fact that this is not designed for children. According to this legislation, they're saying we have to assume that children access everything. And therefore, the way we create content has to be age appropriate, or at least have so many age verifications in place to really ensure that kids can navigate things online safely. The next thing I want to talk about is this comprehensive sexuality education, because it is a seminal piece of work that was designed across the world in tiny little favelas where you have parteras and doulas and people working in the community to talk about how to best create really, really forward-thinking sexual health policy and sexual health practice. And the three things that I love about this are, the first is that the more we talk about this with our children, is they become more critical in their consumption of sexual knowledge and information. So if you, as parents, initiate conversations around sex and well-being, they are more likely to push forward when their first experience of sex is going to be. They are also, secondly, more likely to use safer sex methods and practices and contraceptives. And it also, very interestingly, they found that more people who are spoken to all the time about sex and sexual health are found in, in these small communities. There is a reduction of sexual violence. 
And that is pivotal because this is where we are right now. In a moment, I live in London and there's been a lot of noise around this very important piece of legislation. It's called keeping children safe. And it's all about the fact that we know that young people online are harassing each other in the way that, for instance, you can send a sext to a friend or to a boyfriend or to whoever your partner is, and that can be then exploited, right? It can be sent on. So we have to teach kids that as critical consumers, where they're getting their knowledge, where they're getting their information, who is making this content, what kind of content are they creating? There's been a lot of conversations on that. So I'm more interested in talking about the fact that we need to, as parents, really discuss that being a user-generated content platform means that it is designed to get them to overshare. And what does overshare mean? And we have to really be able to talk about that with kids because once it's out there, it doesn't come back and we understand this. But when I go into schools, I often find that kids who might have made a mistake online and don't know then how to erase it or how to deal with it, I ask them, well, why didn't you tell a parent? Why didn't you tell a trusted adult? And they will say something like, because I don't want them to take my phone away. And it's so interesting that the fear of reporting problematic behavior is, pre is preventing them from being able to actually, you know, behave safely online. So my advice to all of you, if you are a parent, is to really nurture that trust to take away the blame. This is their social currency. It is their currency. They know this is how they navigate each other. This is how they communicate with each other. Removing devices does not remove the problem. It removes the opportunity to really deal with the problem. So I really urge you to think about that. Some of the kind of trends that I'm seeing now with sexual health and how it has to be today in terms of how they access digital content is really creating safe spaces for young kids and they have so much power in their pocket. So what I really want to focus on is the last bit of the slide is this idea of challenging stereotypes and social nuance. There's a brilliant professor named Katherine Sanderson who works in the University of Amherst. She talks about how young people are the ones who have to come up with the, with the solutions to their problems. And how you do that is, for instance, I'll give you an example. I was at a school two weeks ago at a leading, very elite, all boys school with 250 kids in the audience. And one was like, miss, you know, how do I know if I'm watching too much porn? And I was like, amazing question, because that's quite a lot to admit in front of other people. And I decided that it's really not my place to give them the answer. So I offered the Q&A to the students. And the way they answered his question was really powerful. They gave the student tips. They talked about the problems of, of porn. They really focused on the fact that they're the ones who are setting the social nuance. They're the ones who are setting whether or not it's acceptable. It's not acceptable. How much is too much? And I think it's something that we really need to start focusing more in schools and how we change behaviors, problematic behaviors in terms of violence, um, sexual harassment, all sorts of those kinds of things in that space. And it really comes down to giving kids the opportunity to understand that they're the ones that are creating these nuances. So if we give them the opportunity to understand that actually making a sexist joke or a rape joke is not funny because they no longer think it's funny, that's when we're gonna get change. That's when we're gonna start getting much more interesting type of sexual health policies. When kids understand that consent has to be at the center of how we talk about relationships. That we have to give spaces for children who identify as trans, as non-binary, as asexual. It has to be right space, but we have to allow the students to come up with that understanding of where they're coming from. So it's been a pleasure to talk to you here tonight. I'm now gonna open the floor to questions if there are any. Thank you. Great question. How can we keep children away from adult content? Many view it before they are mature enough. That's very true. So in the UK, we know that kids as young as 11 years old can access pornography. So the truth is that whilst we know that some of the policies of age verification is coming into place much more, I don't think you can shield it from it. So I think the more important bit is to talk to them and explain that Porn sex is not the same 
as real life good sex, that there is no conversation around consent amongst porn actors or sex workers, that most porn or sex workers do not demonstrate how most people look in the world, that women are hairy, that men don't all have six packs, that in fact, most porn male actors have penises that are 35% larger than most males. So it's really important, I think, to again, anticipate and tell them, if you ever see something like this, come talk to me. It might be really upsetting or in some way, you know, disturbing. And we need you to understand that this is not normal. It's a billion dollar industry. Next question, how can we use technology to best support the LGBTQ plus community here at ASF? That's a great question. Um, you know, I'm a real believer in student voice. And there is a fantastic website, actually tool, that's called Mentimeter. And I know that we really need to use technology in better ways around how we educate students and how we educate ourselves. One idea could be to have an assembly and allow your students to use their phones. I know, sorry, but maybe that's just for one time. And Mentimeter is this app that basically you pose a question and you answer it in real time. And then a word cloud comes out. And what's really interesting is that, again, it comes back to this social nuance because children will automatically see what are the main issues here? How can we better protect the LGBT community here? What are their issues? What are they feeling? And I believe really, really firmly that that's where you're going to get better progress and actually more authentic learning. At which age can you start talking about sex to your children? I love this question. So at a very young age, Children are born as sexual beings. I mean, one time I was at a school and they prohibited me from using the word masturbation and I was floored because I was like, I know this is a conservative society, but you know, pediatricians use masturbation in terms of the idea of self-soothing. So I think talking about sex at a young age is very important. You can often allow children to set the stage. So one example is to explain, if you see someone who's pregnant, talk about, just at the beginning, reproductive rights, reproductive health, and how did that person become pregnant? And what I find is often you might let the child then continue to ask the questions. And they are very good at being able to kind of cut off and know when they've learned enough and when they're, free, when they're okay. So we're out of time, but just very quickly, I want to sum up by saying, there's a couple of things I really, really can tell you as a sexual health educator. Nurture self-worth and self-esteem in your children. Don't talk about body image. Talk about what your bodies can do. Correct terms. I always assume that there are children who are neurodiverse in my audiences. That means they have to understand what you're talking about. You need to use correct terms in terms of sexual beings, in terms of what you are. There's no nuance to naming something than what it actually is. And a little, a lot, back to this question of when is it the right time? They will lead you. It has to be repeated. They want to know a little bit now, a little bit more later, a lot more later, and that's okay. That's how things happen. So anyways, thank you very much for welcoming tonight. Thank you. Yes, yes. What a great pool of interesting topics, don't you think? Our next speaker is a based in London architect, an interactive designer working in the intersection of music, media, and design. He has an interest in musical performance, audiovisual performance, architecture, interactive design, and new media. His most recent work has focused on audiovisual artwork, synchronizing animations, interactive media, and installations to the volume, tempo, and frequency of sound. Driven by an ever-growing obsession for music, Ricardo aims to utilize his background in design, his curiosity in media, and technological innovation to bring an unconventional light to the act of performance. Please help me virtually welcome Ricardo Lopez, class of 2011. Hi, my name is Ricardo Adrián López Gutiérrez, ASF class of 2011, and in the scope of this conference, I want to talk to you about creativity through technology and technology as a medium for art. And to do this, I really want to tell you my story from the beginning. 
When I was a kid, all I wanted to do was make things, and these were some of my favorite toys. All of them gave me infinite possibility, and from a very young age I felt, this is it. I don't have a name for it yet, but this expression of creativity, this is what it's all about. So when my parents saw this, they said, well, he would make a great architect. And so a lot of models, drawings, sleepless nights, dressing in black, and a pair of glasses later, I became an architect. And I had the opportunity to work at LBRMA for four years where I supervised the design of residential projects and the construction of one of them. I got to see the whole architect picture. I designed spaces, I did the drawings, the renders, uh, I, coordinated, I coordinated structure and engineering. But I wasn't only just interested in architecture. In fact, before choosing architecture, these are the electives I took in high school at ASF. And what I'm seeing there is an interest in music, media, and design. And to this day, professionally, these are the most important things to me. So I was very curious to see if there was a way for me to bring them together and explore my creativity. And luckily, I found one. I found a course in Design for Performance Interaction at UCL here East, and it was one of the best choices I made because now I had access to cutting edge facilities to design, build, experiment, and broadcast. And what was amazing about this program was the intersection of disciplines. I got to collaborate with other architects, yes, but I also got to work with dancers and musicians and lighting designers, coders, engineers, neuroscientists, artists, and people from animation who all made me grow a lot. And I loved it. I, I needed to learn how to code, and that was kind of scary, but it was so worth it because it began, it began opening so many new doors. This was one of the first exercises, and we were learning creative coding. The brief was very open, so if I could do anything, well, of course, I'm going to put music in it. So I made an interactive music visualizer where I programmed six scenarios that reacted to music. And you could change sound to influence visuals. And it was a kind of new fun for me. This was another experiment in collaboration with Korean artist Yangwon Choi. And what I loved about this is that creativity wasn't constrained physically. And I was exploring once again. Here we wanted to see how we could create something new out of something that already happened. So we were overlaying versions of our past in real time with our present. And the idea of memory and recording became central to our work. This is the evolution of my thesis project with Choi. And it was inspired by memory and how we distort memory every time we remember. He was interested in machine learning, I was into music, so we made an installation that could create music from the recordings of people. We got the chance to exhibit this in London, and it looked like this. music you heard was someone recording for a long time and after the recording the memories distorted again and again and the sound and light evolve until it creates music and then the memory fades away. All the spheres had lights, a microphone and a small computer inside and the, the only difference is one played low notes, one middle notes and one high notes so it was an instrument influenced by the voices of people. 
and it was just one of the coolest moments last year because I had never exhibited in a gallery and suddenly I'm, I'm being asked how I became an artist and I said, well, I'm not, I'm, I'm just exploring the things I'm very curious about. And I don't know if that's art, but it's very exciting. We then had the opportunity to exhibit the project at Ars Electronica and we wanted to level up. We, we wanted to experience an intuitive and immersive scenario. We changed the whole system, threw in a lot of cables. We still had three microphones, but three spheres became 27, and now microphones controlled everything. Hi! Ability. And that was both a lot of fun and very intense, but it was inspiring to see people interact with our work without instruction. And these were some of the different light scenarios triggered by people. And that experience gave us a new question. In the final version, we were asking ourselves, how can we create music from the memory of an audience? And we changed the installation, the meaning, the shape, the code, the interaction behind it. We scaled up once again. We made the lamps ourselves. And we had a lot of help in this one because there was very little time to make it. And the result was this. So it ended up as a light and sound installation that creates a symphony from vocal expression. It musicalizes everything you say and it shapes sound to light. Meaning if you say something quickly, it creates a light ripple. And if you say a long speech, it makes a beautiful sound and light experience. I, I look at this and I wonder, is this art, sound, light, code, design? Is this architecture? I don't know, but through technology, we brought them together. And it's challenging, but when it works, it's the most amazing thing. It's almost miraculous. And it makes me realize the following couldn't be more true. 
The roots of education are bitter, but the fruit is sweet. And when it comes to creativity, it's so, so, so sweet because it's opening so many avenues for exploration. And I can't wait to see what Neil Doors technology opens for art. Thank you very much for your time. And I'm happy to take any questions. I'm hoping I can answer uh, some of them. ¿Por dónde recibo las preguntas? Oh. Okay, hi, hi, how did uh, I, it's a long answer. Um, how did we convert voices to music? I mean, the, the, the short answer is we used a uh, software that recently came out. It's called uh, Doubler 2, and um, that musicalizes voice in real time. So we tapped into that software, and um, the, we threw in some custom code through Max MSP, but uh, really the key was that software that recently came out, uh, musicalized voice to speech, and then we threw it to the light conversion system. But, um, I mean, yeah, you don't have to... to um, to invent stuff, this extra software came at the right time, and we used that. But I'm happy to go into more detail to, to anyone who's interested. Uh, how music can improve mental health. Uh, I guess it depends what music you you listen, but um, how, how? I guess it, it, from from my point of view, the, the the music that gets you into the zone, into into a into a state where you feel um, comfortable. I I I don't think I've ever said this, uh, but um, I get I get distracted super easily, and um, music really helped me focus into any creative task. And I, I guess that's why I, I love it so much. Uh, side by side to 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 creative pursuits, because uh, yeah, it gives me it gives me focus. And I guess I, I guess that's a way to to improve um, mental health through through music, finding the right um, frequency to tune into and it's and it's a very personal choice uh, it's not a specific set list that you have to listen to uh, uh, <laughs> this this what is the most amazing technology uh, advancement in music the the skills that i tapped to in in last year um so so check uh, this out. I didn't know this before, but when you see, for example, in Zoom, your your microphone going like green or red, that's throwing some values. Uh, so uh, a certain amount of, of volume that has musical value, that has mathematical values you can tap into. When you play the keyword, every key that gives a mathematical value, and it's not an invention per se, but it's just knowing that music is math and that every note has a mathematical value, that then becomes code. And I think that was the most amazing breakthrough last year for me because um, that's how you can use uh, music to create experiences. Um, yeah, math, math is cool, I guess. <laughs> I guess that's the answer. Um, sound dynamics into architecture. This was, I mean, the, the, the last installation, um, the one with Troy I showed, 
That was getting nearer to, to architecture. It's still pavilion scale, but um, but yeah, I guess it's the next steps. Uh, we are we are pitching right now to light festivals, and um, that's going to be a bigger scale. And it's going to be a bigger scale, well, not necessarily, but it's going to get bigger. Uh, I mean, architecture, from, from, from what I've experienced, it takes a lot of budget, and a lot of things have to happen to, to, to build things, not just money or the clients, but um, like a lot of legal things have to go through. And um, as... as uh, mm -hmm. As opposite to installations, those yeah require things, but um, the budget and the legal constraints are a lot smaller. So um, no, I I I I haven't gone full on building scale, but uh, yeah, it's it's a start. Installations and pavilions are a start. Have you tried to implement what you have showed us tonight in a home design? Could you repeat the question? Have you tried to implement what you have showed us tonight in a home design? Um, what I what I showed you in a home design? No, I haven't. And in fact, I'm I'm not. I mean, I I can always go back to traditional architecture, but I mean, knowing that these things exist, it's hard to think about houses in the way uh, I I used to. It's hard to think about space in the way I I used to because. Um, in architecture, they teach you how to build with um, uh, local materials, concrete, steel, uh, glass, and uh, I mean, there's a, there's a there's like a list, and that's it. But when you can build with movement and sound and light, and I mean, the list goes on. But like, you get materials you wouldn't normally think. So that's why I haven't implemented in a house design, and I don't think I would. I, I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll say this answer again in, in some years, but at, at least right now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not thinking about it. Last question. How did ASF help you in your career? How, how did ASF help me in my career? Well, I, I didn't know this until I reflected um, until uh, until I, I I had retrospection, but I mean ASF gave me a platform to to explore to choose. So I mean I, I wasn't as grateful as I am today. The electives that was everything because um, when you're 18 you have to choose a career a path and supposedly that's it like that you choose and and that's gonna be your life forever, and it's not. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it can be, or, it, it, or it, it doesn't have to be. What I'm saying is ASF gave me the opportunity to explore my interests. And um, when I was given the freedom to choose without having to choose one, I was choosing exactly all the things that I was curious about, which, um, which I go back today. And ASF fostered that, uh, that, that curiosity. I, I owe it. I, I owe that to, to yourself, and I'm very grateful for it. I, I, I want to say one last thing that I, that I thought this morning. And uh, with the things we are doing with technology right now and, and art, I don't know if they're art or if they can call be art, but what I do think is art is looking into your soul and your uh, core beliefs, your core interests, and offering that to the world, that's the most beautiful thing anyone can do. And uh, in regards of technology affecting the human experience, um, being able to offer that to the world, I, I think technology is giving us um, very unique keys we didn't have before. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Irene de la Yata de Ansaldúa, or Ms. Ansaldúa as she was known in the ASF, had a 53-year association with our school as a student, teacher, parent, principal, and alumnus. When she tragically passed away in a car accident in 1990, a plaque was placed in the lower school building in her honor that simply reads, Her Truth Remains. 
Irene was born in Mexico City on July 21st, 1919. Her life changed when she lost her father at the tender age of two. Her mother decided to take a position as a superintendent at a municipal school near her home in Chacaltianguis, Veracruz. And this is where Irene started her love for learning. In February 1927, they returned to Mexico City, where she attended and completed her primary education at a private school her mother had opened. In 1934, she applied to attend La Normal, where only 100 out of 800 applicants are accepted. She was one of the lucky few. She would reminisce that there she learned to teach with creativity to make up for the lack of resources that existed. Irene became increasingly interested in the study of child education, psychology, and history. She especially enjoyed learning about Mexican history. She graduated in 1937 with the highest average in her class, but she still yearned for more, so she entered ASF as a special case student, so she could become immersed in the English language. She took English subjects in the morning and taught Spanish to elementary students in the afternoons. By 1939, she had landed her first formal teaching position at ASF. As her teaching career took off, Irene got married and had two daughters, Carmelita and Maria Luisa. Both attended ASF, naturally. Misan Saldua became elementary school principal and the liaison with the Mexican Ministry of Education. Her commitment allowed ASF to be incorporated into SEP, motivating students and faculty to become more bicultural. She advocated that our students experience traditional American schooling alongside a Mexican education and be exposed to many different cultures. Thanks to her, we celebrate Dia de Muertos, Dia de la Bandera, along with Hanukkah and the Chinese New Year at ASF, among others. Upon her retirement, Irene continued to be a huge part of ASF, notably as president of the Alumni Association. As president, she assisted in coordinating the ASF Centennial Celebration festivities, where a photo of her right hand guiding the hand of a child in the process of learning became an iconic image. Misan Saldua's energy, kindness, and sincerity is still fondly remembered by all who knew her. As elementary principal, her door was always open, and she always had a warm smile, along with some crayons and paper for the little unexpected visitors at recess. Her contribution to our school is so important that the highest honor awarded to our teachers every Founders Day bears her name, Irene de la Yata de Ansaldúa Award, and recognizes those who have had the greatest impact on our students. But we should always remember her own words when she said, I gave a lot to the American school, but it gave a lot to me too. Miss Ansaldúa, your truth remains. emoción, está muy bonito lo que dijeron de mi mamá. Este, mi mamá amó a esta escuela y yo creo que estaría muy contenta de que se le reconociera hoy. Y linda que estuvo con ella. Quiero hablar en español porque para mi mamá era muy importante que esta escuela siempre fuera bicultural. Y esa es una de las cosas que ella promovió siempre. Y la verdad es que mi mamá fue muy feliz aquí. Estaría muy feliz de estar hoy ver que se le reconoce el trabajo que hizo para esta escuela. Y yo creo que lo que dice ahí al final, mi mamá no hubiera sido la misma sin la escuela, pero esta escuela no sería esto sin mi mamá. Eso lo creo profundamente. Y les agradezco a todos su asistencia. A huge event like this is impossible without the help of our beautiful sponsors. And we do have to say that ours are the best. Thank you for spoiling us with all the delicious food and drinks. And in this event, in, in memoriam to this digital revolution, our sponsor, Viaja Plus, an innovative digital business subscription that allows us to travel with up to 60% off 
uh, to discounts, is giving away a subscription to both panelists and some lucky winners in the audience tonight. So if you find a star like this um, within your seats where you rest your hands, you are one of the lucky winners. And a small tip, there is a star that way and there is no one sitting there. Also, for those that did not have the opportunity to join us physically today, you can find different um, giveaways, discounts, etc. in the link above. Find them to travel 60% off. Yeah? Woo! Super. Congratulations. Okay. Small star. We have two winners. Woo, third winner. Congratulations. Perfect. We are about to end the night with very powerful women. Our last speaker was acknowledged in 2016 as one of the top 50 marketing leaders by the magazine Merca 2.0 in 2017. She was on the 100 Most Powerful Women in Mexico list published by Expansión Magazine. PR News awarded her with the Top Women in PR 2018 at Latina at Age as a Women to Watch in 2020. And most recently, she was recognized as a PR professional of Latin America in 2021 by PR Week. She currently sits on the board of various NGOs, such as CEMEFI, the Mexican Philanthropic Center, Museum of, Me of Memory and Tolerance, Abogada CMX, SEMDA, the Mexican Center for Environmental Law, and Universidad Iberoamericana, focused on promoting and strengthening higher education in Mexico. Let's give a warm welcome to Amanda Bernstein, class of 97. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I get to be the last, which I don't know if it's such a great idea, so I'll be really, really fast. Um, thank you very much for, for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Can I have the presentation on the screen? So I'm going to talk about something totally different, obviously about PR, media, communications, and it has to do from politics to brands to cancel culture. And basically, it's the impact of technology in our media landscape today. Um, so COVID-19 pretty much disrupted every part of our lives, including our media, social, and, and, and all our media habits. It affected public health, obviously, information systems, economic landscape, and our media consumption. But media, social media, and brands were changing before COVID, and the pandemic just greatly accelerated that change. So understanding how media is created, discovered, shared, consumed, is more critical than ever. And especially because we're talking about technology and the impact technology has on our media world. So many of the media habits um, formed during COVID could stick around for the long haul. A lot of the lo-fi production that we saw during COVID we're seeing um, today. Um, also, and I think this, this is what you know, I really am passionate about, how companies and brands are involving their communications, not only because of what we lived um, through COVID and, and with the COVID impact, but in general, how culture is changing the way we communicate inside out and outside in. And we'll talk about this a little further ahead. So basically, I'm going to talk about four emerging trends that we see in media today. One is updatedness versus understanding. 
a modern content canvas, which I'll talk about, a new definition of culture, which is very different than the traditional concept of culture that we have, and especially purpose leadership and how companies are becoming social platforms of change. So the kind of sort of scary rise of updatedness. We're obsessed with being updated. And this is sort of what our feed looks like. I mean, we're totally into listening, checking, revising. We go from LinkedIn to Facebook, from Facebook to TikTok, from TikTok to Instagram stories. And it's incredible how much content we're consuming. But are we understanding what we're consuming? So this is really what we've noticed. Um, and I work in a, in a communications and PR firm. Clearly, you guys heard the word PR pretty much. But basically, what we're trying to understand is being so wired creates two things. One, lack of control. And two, lack of comprehension. And this is really impactful. And this is really changing the way we understand media. And more importantly, how we talk to consumers today. So anyone plugged in is left sort of combating updatedness versus understanding. And this is driving a search for reliable information as a society into very different alternative sources. So you obviously have citizen content, right, which is us taking uh, you know, out our phone and really catching somebody doing something and then sharing it. We're doing deep reporting. We're finding that also deep length um, format is important, especially when we were talking about health and COVID-19. We wanted to get more details and more information. Twitter is definitely a source of information. Data visualization and simulations have become an input, an important input of information. Um, Employer and internal communications, this has changed dramatically. We used to be talking about internal communications like the HR person sending an email. That has totally changed because companies became health companies in a way during COVID. So they really had to communicate differently to their employees. And finally, content aggregators or newsletters. We've become, and we've become obsessed, sort of our inbox is our new news feed with these five, you know, the five top um, things from CNN. So we still talk about traditional media and social media way too separately. And what I want to show as our second trend is really understanding, sorry, the modern can content ca canvas and understanding that it's a platform world. And agility, which we used to understand as speed, is really no longer about speed but format. So you have images, you've got podcasts, you've got audio, you've got chat, you've got alerts, you've got video, you've got memes, and you've got GIFs. And really the challenge that we have today as brands is how we make our story travel through these different platforms. And obviously, there's a new modus operandi. There's definitely media innovation. You know, when I started 15 years ago in PR, press release, everything was, you know, the press conference and the press release. Sorry, whoops. Now it really works. <laughs> um, now we're talking about online video. Desk guide, desk guide briefings have become, you know, AR. Media open houses are now virtual reality. B-rolls are multi-channel social video. So, I mean, I'm, you know, this is just a list of examples of how we're transforming and innovating when it comes to telling our story. Um, for some, short form is still king, TikTok. My daughter, who's here in the audience, um, loves TikTok, and she's convinced that TikTok educates us. And we just started, <laughs> and we just started working with TikTok, so we're going to be doing more education through TikTok. Um, Instagram stories, the meme culture. Others are definitely, and we're seeing a, a rise of slow content, helping us understand and deconstruct this misinformation. Definitely podcasts are on the rise. Before COVID, they started during COVID, they stopped because we really got into live videos. Now we're sort of sick of another Zoom and another live video and we're back to hearing podcasts. Um, definitely we're seeing visual-based customer experiences like visual-based commerce, visual-based search, shoppable media, interactive live video. So here again you see how technology is changing not only the way we read, consume media, what we um, how we share information, but also how we're buying and shopping. And another thing that I find extremely interesting has to do with the gaming and streaming world as a source of information and community. Um, I was just in South by Southwest in Austin. I've never felt 
uh, more as a middle-aged white mom in, in this sort of innovative landscape. But one of the things that I found that was really interesting had to do with the gaming world and how it's become a major source of information, but also mainstream. It's not only the geek world, brands want to be talking to gaming communities. So finally, um, everything's intersecting. Everything matters. Technology, economy, media, policy, marketing, communications are in the middle. And the very definition of culture is changing. It's become more political, more activist. It's not anymore this, this concept of pop culture. We have traditional culture that we have to take into consideration. We've got current affairs. So this whole definition of being sensitive and and really thinking of culture has become incredibly important when we communicate. Um, and it's also accelerated something that's super important that has to do with social impact and brands becoming platforms of social change. And one of the things that I really believe in is purpose leadership and how businesses have to create value and really have to talk to us much more of you know, what they're doing and why they're doing than what they're selling. And I think these are a few key trends that we have to take into consideration when we talk about purpose leadership and social impact. The first thing is authenticity. External image demands internal credibility. The time of greenwashing is gone. Everybody can totally smell a hundred miles away if something is fake and it's just sort of an outward campaign. Then you have this whole idea, and we're seeing it much more, where values and authentic value are becoming the way brands are communicating. So instead of talking to the masses, we're actually talking to the minorities, um, and that is really building reputation to getting to the broader um, audience. So we have something like CVS, which I love this case, which is called Beauty Unaltered, which is a, a logo that they have for all the campaigns that are not edited or are not um, uh, thinned or or changed. We have Xbox adopting their their players, their consoles for kids who have disabilities. And one of my favorite cases is IKEA um, that did a hack where people with disabilities actually helped them design um, design you know lamps and furniture that was accessible for them. We're also seeing um, Uno, you know, doing cards with um, with the idea that there's people that don't see colors and are and are you know are blind. So we got to talk about that. We have Clear Channel that is using their out of home um, presentation to use it as an alert system. And finally, we have Airbnb, which we saw now is housing people and helping people in Ukraine. Yeah. So this is an age of everything, an age of overload. So what I want to leave you with is your content strategy helps you find meaning for a brand. It expresses your values, it finds your audience, and slows the scroll. Our challenge is to slow the scroll. Make information and a story that is relevant. It adds context to a story, and most importantly, it helps your news travel in this modern content canvas through different channels. So brands need a reason to speak, and we need a reason to believe. And I don't know if I have time. I wanted to show, um, I won't go into the videos, because I think we're totally over time, but this is one of my favorite cases. It's called the Climate Store. And basically what, they're do, what they did in Sweden, it's a supermarket in Sweden, and they gave, they listed every item with their carbon dioxide equivalent. So the price is not based on the actual price of how you sell a product, but it's based on the carbon dioxide footprint of the product. So that's a really interesting story. Um, so you have a video if you want to see it, Climate Store um, by Felix. I think we'll skip this video because it's not, there's no sound, but it's a great story. Um, and then finally, the other case that I wanted to show you guys has to do with um, AB and Bev Michelob. Um, and they wanted to showcase that their beer was brewed by the sun, by solar panels. So they partnered with Maluma to create music that has the sound of the sun. So let's play this video, please. So this is the end of the presentation. I hope um, you found it interesting and, and, and you really have a new point of view on three things. One, how technology is impacting information and our media consumption, how we have to think how stories have to travel through different platforms, and finally, how impact and social purpose is becoming the new corporate voice for brands. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much.
How is the quality and quantity of digital content affecting society? Should brands take this into account when designing marketing strategies? Um, yes, yes, I do think. Um, I, I, it's it's an interesting question because it, you know how much how much is education and and making sure consumers are taking their own decisions and consuming the way they want their their social their social content and how much does a brand really want to engage with their consumers? I I believe that there's not a limit or or it's not the role of a brand to to limit social consumption what i do feel is that we have to be playing a significant role brands have to play a significant role in our lives and if they're not playing a significant role in our lives then we won't even consume what they're telling us so i really think that it has more to do with the purpose with the message with the storytelling that goes beyond the business than really telling a consumer how much they got to how much they got to consume but definitely brands have become much more conscious of societal issues and they're considering those subjects in their messaging so we do see brands taking a stand on those issues how much responsibility brands have in the effect of digital media in the consumers it's sort of the same thing i think it has to do with social purpose and 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 how brands really can push the social agenda we saw it with the gaming community there wasn't a lot of girls in gaming and activision which is a huge um, um gaming brand has really pushed the agenda and included more women in gaming so i do feel that brands can change our world yes i do believe that and i do believe that this is something that they'll definitely be able to consider in their storytelling and in their corporate narrative for sure i don't know if everybody or anybody else has a question no super thank you very much Thank you, Amanda, for a very interesting talk. And we've had many interesting talks this night. So I would like to welcome all of our speakers on stage to give them one last big round of applause. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and for speaking tonight. We invite you all to enjoy a wonderful cocktail in the Fine Arts Center lobby and in the cafeteria to further um, keep talking. Thank you for joining us.